Uh, hi everybody, this is Dr. Stephanie Tingley, and um, I newly retired from the English department uh, at YSU. I taught 31 years, and I'm your guest today. I was supposed to be in class to talk with you a little bit about some connections between literature and music, poetry and music, but um, the virus got in the way. So from my kitchen to your laptop, um, here goes. Uh, there are three uh, sections to this talk. There are three separate files that are posted in Blackboard video links, and there's also a Word document handout with some sample poems that we'll be working with in the second and the third sections. So if you could pull up that handout or print it out so that you have it handy, that would be really great because I want to refer to it, and I'm not going to try to share my screen with that. Um, anyway, I'm pleased to be with you this morning, and... Um, Let's get going. You know, this is going to be rough. I'm just going to keep recording. Say, um, you may hear my puppy barking. Um, it'll feel like I'm stumbling and bumbling in class. So rather, I don't have a script. In other words, I'm just going to talk and chatter and flip through my slides. So here goes. I uh, want to focus today on some interconnections, interdisciplinary interconnections between music and um, literature, especially poetry, especially American poetry. And the focus here on two 19th century American poets, Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, um, names you may know or may have heard or poet, whose poems you may know a little bit about. So let's start by um, talking a little bit about some of the connections between poetry and song. And um, just remind you that in lots of ways, poetry and song are closely linked historically, going way back to the oral tradition. If you think about um, something, um, storytelling, song poems, uh, bards would um, perform the poems, and that was part of the way that uh, the people who were listening and the poets themselves remembered things. Poetry um, also depends both on the words on the page and the sounds. Of the language so you need both your eye and your ear to uh, read poetry well and um, we'll be talk looking at some examples where that's true so hearing the words um, can really make a difference um, as you've learned in class uh, many literary texts especially poems have been set to music german leader remember music history three the biblical and the hymn text set to music at the start of the course and uh, I, if I look familiar, I've been um, sitting in on, uh, as a retiree, um, both Music 3 last semester and Music 4 this semester. So I've been sitting among some of you um, this semester, and I miss everybody face to face. And um, poetry does share some things with music. Um, there's this kind of specialized language, so I know you all are used to studying a musical score. Um, we also have tools, as you know, for analyzing and studying poetry as a text. And I wanted to point particularly to some of the, the patterns, the rhythm and meter, iambic pentameter, you may know, the eight and six common meter that we encountered at the beginning of the semester with some of the hymns. Emily Dickinson made use of that common meter. Um, you also have um, sound patterns, vowel sounds, repeating, assonance, consonants, uh, repeated um, consonant sounds like a series of t -t 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 t's, uh, rhyme, not all poetry rhymes, but poets make use of those uh, qualities that um, connect to your ear, sort of in the way music does, as well as to your eye. And I just wanted to start there before we plunge into more detail. Uh, we also, um, I think, talked a little bit in class early on about um, the early days in New England and the early years of American music where um, Americans were busy carving out, you know, a place to live. They needed food, they needed shelter, they didn't have a whole lot of time or energy to create art or create great art. Um, and um, at the same time that the colonies were getting developed in early 17th century, um, you know, uh, America, uh, you got to think about what was happening in Europe at the time and how highly developed um, European art, uh, music, literature were. 
And um, so there's a real contrast there, um, makes sense. Uh, the colonists were, as I said, focused on hacking a settlement out of the wilderness, so they didn't have much time to think about um, writing a poem or uh, composing a symphony. Uh, so um, even into the 19th century, American art, music, and literature was seen as inferior to that of Europe. And I guess it was, you know, on some level, since they were just getting started. Um, and both Americans and Europeans, Europeans uh, share that point of view. Uh, so often the um, Americans went to Europe to study. They imitated European forms and styles. They tried to be as good, if you know what I mean. And um, starting in the 19th century, though, um, there was a real call for American art, music, and literature that was ours, that was original. And that's where I want to focus next. Uh, a lot of you may know the name here, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a 19th century American philosopher, writer, lecturer associated with the Transcendentalist movement. Um, American nature was their focus. Um, and how you could learn about God and the oversoul by looking at nature. Um, he was based in Boston and Concord, Mass. And um, let's uh, poke along here. He um, was really concerned with wanting to encourage American artists to not imitate Europe, but to be original. And so he wrote a couple of famous essays where he worried about this and called for uh, writers and artists to step up and answer the call. Uh, he wanted American artists to be distinctively American and make use of American ideas, themes, and nature. So rather than trying to imitate Europe, uh, work with what's in America and uh, be original. And there's a picture of old Emerson um, and uh, couple of really quick quotes from his essay in 1837, The American Scholar. We have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. The spirit of the American freeman is already suspected to be timid, timid imitative, and tame. And he's always saying, don't imitate, don't be shy, don't be tame, let it rip, let it be original. And the quote at the bottom there, I know it's kind of covering over my face, which is fine. Uh, we will walk on our own feet. We will work with our own hands. We will speak with our own minds. So that's the goal. Uh, in his essay, The Poet, in 1844, um, the left-hand column, I won't read to you except to say he begins a section by saying, I look in vain for the poet whom I described. So he hasn't found anybody yet as an American artist who can step up in 1844. Uh, the right-hand quote is one of my favorites. He's talking about some of the things that an American artist could write about. Our log rolling, our stumps, and their politics, our fisheries, our Negroes and Indians, our boasts and our repudiations, the wrath of rogues, the pusillanimity of honest men, the northern trade, the southern planting, the western clearing, Oregon and Texas are yet unsung. Yet America is a poem in our eyes. Its ample geography dazzles the imagination, and it will not wait long for meters. So in his mind, use American subject matter and themes, and America itself is a great poem. It's waiting to be written. Two American poets who answered Emerson's call uh, from the middle of the 19th century will be the focus of the second two sections of my little talk today. Um, Emily Dickinson, her dates 1830 to 1886, Walt Whitman, um, her, his dates 1819, uh, 1892. So they were roughly contemporaries. Uh, the Just a little bit about each, very, very quickly. Um, Dickinson, that image is the one daguerreotype um, early photograph that we have of her at age 17, um, and um, it's a kind of formal portrait from her school. Uh, she was located, born, lived, and died in Amherst, Massachusetts, in western Massachusetts, a little college town. You may know Amherst College, University of Massachusetts Amherst, that's, that's her hometown. Um, she never married, she remained single. Um, there's a myth associated with her being a spinster and a recluse, and um, those are um, the, the key points, I think, um, for right now. 
Um, Whitman, on the other hand, um, lived longer, but you know, a little bit born a little sooner, died a whole lot, uh, a little bit later. Uh, but he was based primarily in Long Island, um, New York, although he traveled widely um, across the United States, particularly. The photo that you have is from the frontispiece of his first book, Leaves of Grass. I'm betting that that name is familiar to a lot of you. And he wants to be pictured as a kind of common American, so no suit, but kind of rough working man clothes and this kind of straw hat and the kind of cocky pose, you know, with his um, hand on his hip. Um, he um, uh, sent his first book to Ralph Waldo Emerson, the philosopher we talked about, unsolicited and with a letter and um, asked him to read it and hoped for a review. So he was doing a sales pitch. He was trying to sell his own book. And Whitman did, or Emerson did, in fact, write back and say, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Um, so it worked. The plug worked. Uh, okay. Uh, click along here. Uh, another link that I thought you might find interesting, uh, not only were these folks roughly contemporary, but they uh, both heard Jenny Lind in concert. We talked in class about Jenny Lind, the Swedish Nightingale operatic soprano who did a tour that was hosted by P.T. Barnum, the circus guy, 1851-1852. Um, Dickinson and Whitman never met. Uh, Dickinson did say in one letter when asked about him that she had not read him, and but she'd heard his poetry was disgraceful, although uh, I suspect she probably did read um, Walt Whitman. Whitman would have had no idea about Dickinson since she didn't publish during her lifetime and was kind of hanging out in her home and yard in, in Amherst, Mass. Nevertheless, both of them heard the opera singer Jenny Lind and um, that famous American tour and um, wanted to show you on the next slide their reactions to what they saw when they saw her in concert. Uh, Dickinson traveled to the nearby town of Northampton to hear the concert and Whitman was an opera critic and so he went to see her very last show and wrote about it for a newspaper. Um, there's old Miss Jenny, one image that I could find, uh, a little card that they'd handed out like a postcard, a souvenir. Um, Dickinson's reaction on July 3rd, um, 1851, Emily, age 20, along with her father and sister, attended Lynn's concert in Northampton. That's the next little town over from Amherst. How we all love Jenny Lind, this is from a letter, but not accustomed oft to her manner of singing, didn't fancy that so well as we did her. No doubt it was very fine, but take some notes from her echo, the bird songs from the bird song, and some of her curious trills, and I'd rather have a Yankee. Herself, and not her music, was what we seemed to love. She has an air of exile in her mild blue eyes, and a something sweet and touching in her native accent, which charms her many friends. Interesting that Dickinson was writing a kind of critical review, and I love the phrase, I'd rather have a Yankee. So when we talked a little bit about the need for an American singer, American poet, uh, she's kind of putting herself in that camp. I wish we had somebody home brewed um, to sing, uh, although she was good and interesting. Uh, Whitman was not as complimentary. He, and these are just a couple of little quotes from his review. After hearing her perform, Whit perform after hearing her perform yeah i can read uh whitman commented on the singing of this strangely overpraised woman writing that she never touched my heart in the least and that there was a vacuum in the head of the performance it was the beauty of adam before god breathed into his nostrils um, i think he's talking here not about like a vacuum cleaner but like something empty about it something that just was not quite right and the allusion to the Sistine Chapel ceiling, Adam before God breathed into his nostrils, or um, if you know the story in the Bible, so a kind of dead performance. I don't know, you guys could come up with better words that just didn't feel animated, um, you know, full of breath, full of energy. Uh, just two interesting uh, contemporary remarks about the same, having seen and heard pretty much the same thing. Uh, finally, um, to end this part of the show, uh, of the lecture, or whatever you want to call it, uh, my ramblings, I uh, wanted to talk just a little bit about Whitman and Dickinson and do a little bit of compare and contrast. And um, this will get us ready for um, 
the next section, which is uh, you'll want to pull up the file that's called Dickinson and Music. Uh, we'll turn our attention there. And then the third and final will be Whitman and Music. So um, we click, click here and start us out. I'm sorry this is so tiny, but um, I'll try to read it um, from the screen here. Uh, Dickinson reached the height of her poetic productivity during the 1860s, the Civil War era. That's where she wrote the most energetically and the most prolifically. The same was true as of Whitman when we get to the other side of my compare and contrast chart. Woo woo. Um, her poetic style, if you know anything about Dickinson, is very distinctive. Uh, lots of short, dense, cryptic, riddling poems. Um, they're very hard to figure out. Um, eccentric uses of punctuation. Lots of dashes, weird capitals. If you've ever read a Dickinson poem, you know what you're reading. There's no mistaking it. And um, they're like little riddles, little nuts to crack. Uh, and um, she's primarily known as a private poet. Um, she lived a mostly private life at home. And home meant a working farm, by the way, for what it's worth. Um, she didn't travel much. Um, as she grew older, she stuck more and more to her home and grounds. Um, she didn't have a lot of visitors. Uh, she connected with a lot of people through correspondence, through the mail, um, rather than face-to-face, -face. sent them poems. Um, and um, she closely observed daily life. So she would look around her Amherst home yard and she'd kind of use that as a springboard for um, thinking really deep thoughts about um, philosophical themes. So she might look at, or one famous poem is, um, some keep, uh, um, I can't remember, oh, never mind, um, bad example. Um, so she, she's talking a lot about things and then she'll make a leap. So she'll say, I'm in my orchard. Um, there's a poem um, about the Sabbath. Um, most people are in church. I'm in my orchard listening to the choristers, the songbirds. And that's my church and that's my religious experience. So she takes the ordinary everyday around her and she turns it into a amusing about life, death, nature, religion, belief, doubt, um, all those all those themes. Uh, Whitman, on the other hand, um, again, he too reached the height of his productivity during the 1860s, the Civil War era. Um, and um, he wrote more directly about current events and politics um, than Dickinson did, although they both were very much tuned into what was going on in their time and in their place. Um, his verses, by contrast, his poems, free verse, they call it, not necessarily rhymed, no set line length, long baggy poems with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of details, lists, catalogs. They go on and they go on and on and on and on and on. Like he's trying to put everything on the planet into his poems. And we'll see some examples um, in the third section of um, this presentation. Uh, he traveled widely across America, especially uh, unlike Dickinson. He had lots of jobs. He was a newspaperman. Uh, he lived in New Orleans for a while, so we saw the slave trade. Um, he was a critic, uh, opera critic, uh, book critic. Uh, and interestingly, I always think he was a Civil War nurse. His brother got wounded and wound up in the hospital, Civil War hospital, for the Union in Washington, D.C., one of the hospitals. I can't remember the, the details. Um, and um, he, you know, they didn't have many nurses um, and conditions were dire. So he went to the hospital to help nurse his brother as a volunteer. And he wound up doing things like tending to a lot of the other men on the ward, writing letters for them that they wanted sent home from their family, those kinds of things. So the two poets are connected in you know several important ways, but their poems are, are very, very different. So um, there's this extreme contrast between the tough, small, little riddling poems of Dickinson and the big baggy ones of Whitman. That, I believe, takes us to the end of the first section. So thank you for listening, and uh, remember to pull up that Word document handout because we're going to use it in one section um, to look a little bit at 
to, in the next two sections to look at a couple samples of Dickinson's and Whitman's poetry. Okay, till next time.